Hey, sports fans, time to take your seat in the stands. For the next hour, it's a kind voice on sports with your host, Demetrius Means. He'll have insights, interviews, and more. And now, your half-court, 50-yard line seat for sports, Demetrius Means. And uh, thank you very much, and hello, everyone. This is Demetrius Means, your host, and we welcome you to a kind voice on sports. And as always, I have a special guest with me today. His name is Nicky Burns. He is the host of Profiles a show in New York City that has almost 8 million viewers, and he has interviewed many people from the celebrity ranks as well as the show show business, Uh, many people like Joan Rivers, Danny Glover, Joan Collins, Larry Holmes, and the list just continues to go on and on and on. Also, he is a former high school basketball coach, and I'm glad to say, Coach Burns, Mickey Burns, how are you doing today? Demetrius, it's an honor to be on your show, and thanks for asking me. I really appreciate it. Well, first of all, it's not every day that uh, a former football player, an all-star one at that back in high school, also an all-star in baseball, where you see many athletes go from, as a, uh, excuse me, a coach into the seat of a talk show host. You see them go to, the, to broadcasting as an analyst, but never as a talk show host. That's got to mean a lot to you. Well, it's, it's, it's an interesting question because I guess being a former athlete uh, qualifies me to be on your show, right? This is a sports show. Absolutely. And, yeah, that, I mean, that was basically my, my roots have, were in sports like yours were. And uh, it, it basically got me out of New York City and got me a, earned me a, a, sco- a scholarship to a college in the Midwest where I played football and baseball uh, from Missouri Valley College. And then, of course, got into coaching uh, after graduating from college. So sports has been a major part of my life uh, for, for, for many, many years. One of the toughest things that may happen during this interview for me is, is that not only am I very close to you, but I have such a deep respect, especially uh, during my playing days as a basketball player. You were my high school coach, and I may – often continue to call you Coach Burns because of the deep respect that I don't feel comfortable enough by calling you by your first name, Mickey. But uh, just for our our listeners, uh, Mickey did coach me in high school, and uh, he was one of the greatest coaches that I've ever had. And, Coach, one of the things about you as a, a basketball coach, not only were you a good coach, but you were a great communicator. And how much of your coaching days translate into helping you to become a good host for profiles or show that you do now in New York City? Well, that, that's a very interesting question, Demetrius. I never I never even thought about it that way. Uh, but I guess coaching is, is a lot of show business, right? It's a lot of theatrics. Um, it's a lot of presentation, uh, especially amongst the, the kids you're coaching, because you, you, you're selling, you have to sell, just like a, as a host on a show. I mean, you're selling your show. And, and if, if it's good, people will want to be on it. And it's not so different from coaching uh, basketball players or football players. And that is you have to somehow have them buy into your philosophy uh, on a daily basis. In your case, I mean, we coach, I coached your team from when they were freshmen all the way through seniors. That was a little bit, a little bit unique in those days. We started on the JV together and we went up to the varsity. So, I mean, after four years of being together, we were like family. You guys certainly brought it, bought into the system that I had created. And um, and we by your senior year, that team was one of the top teams in the nation. Uh, and, it, and it didn't come about from, from a lack of hard work. It came, it came about from four years of working together, believing in each other, and an enormous amount of hard work. Hmm. Did you ever think that during your time as a, a basketball coach that you would someday be a talk show host? Well, actually, uh, when I was in college, that was my goal. I, I, I didn't go to college and say, well, I want to graduate from Missouri Valley College. And I went to graduate school at Central Missouri State University uh, uh, to go into coaching. I wanted to be a broadcaster even back then. But I always say that was B.C., and, and of course, what BC <laughs> means is you know before cable, and 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 the opportunities just weren't there. You know what you had in those days. Most cities had four or five, you know, six channels tops: ABC, NBC, 
uh, CBS and maybe one PBS channel. So uh, the jobs were not as plentiful. So I said, well, geez, you know, should I uh, pound and pound until that opportunity uh, uh, arises, or should I take something more stable and, and, and become a teacher and a coach, which I knew I, I could find a job back in, in New York City. So, so I, I, I got into that the teaching and the coaching, uh, because I thought it was the more prudent thing to do at that time, and, and there weren't many opportunities. If it were today, when I graduated college, I would have found a job somewhere with the Golf Channel or CNN, and, I, and that would have been my career probably for many more years than it has been, although, as you know, I've been in the broadcasting business for 25 years now. So, well, asked, But it would have been a lot more probably. Right. I asked uh, Johnny Newman, former basketball player for the New York Knicks, what practices did he take from his basketball days as a player that has really helped him? And do you take, can you take those same practices that you have in your coaching days to help you in the broadcasting business? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that question uh, because the thing I pride my interviews on the most and get most comments from my guests, and I'm talking about Smokey Robinson and uh, Earl of Pearl Monroe and LaToya Jackson, they, they all comment uh, somewhere during the interview, man, you did your research. And, and I think that's the key to being a good interviewer, a good journalist, a good reporter, is that you never can do enough research. But I think the same thing held true when, when I was coaching. Uh, I did an awful lot of research on, on not only the opponents that we were playing, and also, but preparing our team to know exactly what to expect under all circumstances. And I can remember telling you guys, you know, this, what we're doing today in practice is not what you're going to experience on Saturday night. It's going to be bedlam, the noise level, uh, the confusion, but you have to be able to function equally as well under every condition. And that takes research, repetition, and a lot of hard work. It is obvious that you have done such a fantastic job and you have come a long way, especially now being the host uh, of Profiles, a show that you do now. But I want to go back to your television roots uh, can be traced back to Fox 5 News in New York, where you helped produce the 10 o'clock news for the McQuarrie Report and Sports Extra in 1987. How much did those days prepare you uh, as being the host today uh, with the show Profiles? Yeah, yeah, that that was my training ground uh, because I basically went into, into that experience at Fox uh, having come off of teaching and coaching for many years. So I, I, I really learned on the fire. The first day I was there, we were out on the 10, uh, 10 o'clock news, and, you know, we were at City Hall covering a story with the mayor at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and at 5 o'clock I was on the field at Yankee Stadium uh, you know, talking to Derek Jeter before that game. Uh, and and it, it not only, only prepared me on how the business works from in front and behind the camera, because I think that's important in this business, you know, to know every phase of it, not just one phase. So uh, I basically, when I was at Fox, I learned how to, how to light. I learned how to, how, how to uh, do sound. I learned how to do camera. And most importantly, I learned how to be a good reporter, you know, the way that's expected, uh, you know, from, from the people, the news directors and so forth. I learned how to write for television. But most importantly, I learned how to deal with uh, guests and how to make them feel comfortable and how to get the most out of them. And uh, there's some lessons, you know, some simple lessons, Demetrius, uh, you know, that I learned is, you know, if you if you're interviewing somebody, whether it be on a show or it's on the field at Yankee Stadium, the last the, the, the most important thing is don't act like a reporter. Don't try to be something. You know, be yourself and try to be relaxed, and that will come across on the camera. And people all, often say to me, you know, when I watch your show profiles, it's like you're talking to these celebrities in your living room. And that's the goal going into to almost every interview that I do. But the experience that I got at Fox uh, was all-encompassing. I, I worked up there, I would say, four or five years, and I, I learned every facet of the business during that time and probably wouldn't have been as successful as I have been in broadcasting had I not had that experience. You're listening to A Kind Voice on Sports with your host, Demetrius Means. I am talking with 
Mickey Burns, former high school basketball coach turned talk show host. And Mickey, you were, in 1987 through 1988, you were also a member of the two Emmy Award winning specials, uh, Pro Life versus Pro Choice and Domestic Violence, which you helped produce at Fox. What do you remember back in those days that really helped you uh, to learn your craft today? Right. Uh, well, I realized right from doing those specials that were Emmy Award winning uh, of the commitment necessary to be good in this business. If you weren't willing, I mean, we we used to put in 14, 16-hour days because uh, when you're on a special, you have a certain amount of time to do what you have to do, and if it takes 17, 18 hours a day, you, you do it. Uh, but also, I, I learned how to uh, research a story. I learned how to work on the fire. I, I would like to tell you this quick story. We, when we were doing the domestic violence uh, special, we ended up uh, spending our night in the police station waiting for domestic violence calls. And this one night we, we were there for like five minutes and a call came in and we jumped in the back of the police car. We went to the, to, to the house that made the call and the, the, the wife came running out of the house saying, you know, my husband just hit me and he's got a knife. And so we basically went into the house with the camera crew and the police looking for uh, the husband who was violent, obviously. And I said, geez, you know, I don't, what am I getting myself into here, you know? <laughs> and, and we went to the house and it was dark in the house. It was an old house. And we, uh, to make a long story short, uh, the police noticed that one of the the, uh, the windows was were, was open a, a couple of inches, and it was in the middle of winter, like about this time. And they opened it up, and, and they saw him on the ledge. Uh, so a couple of the police went around to the back, and when they got there, this man, who evidently was not right, probably on some kind of drug, uh, leaped off the, the second floor onto uh, down to the policemen and started wrestling with them on the ground, and this was all doing the special on domestic violence. And then they they handcuffed him, put him in a police car, and right to the police station. And this was, we were only there for like 20 minutes, and we experienced all this excitement. Uh, that that segment that we had in the special, the, uh, when the people out in L.A., Fox people, saw that, that's how the show Cops was developed off of that incident. Wow. They said we should do a show just following the cops around because look at look, look at how realistic this is and how exciting it is, and that all came about from that, you know, that twenty minute uh, experience that we had doing this special in in Plainfield, New Jersey that night. Hmm. And also in nineteen ninety nine, you hosted and anchored and starred in numerous television programs. But we're going to talk about that. We're going to take a break. You're listening to a kind voice on sports. With your host, Demetrius Means, I am talking with Mickey Burns, a former high school basketball coach turned talk show host. We're going to take a quick break. We'll come back with Mickey Burns. You're listening to A Kind Voice on Sports, and we'll be right back after we pause for the cause. A Kind Voice is a call-in line that lives upstream from depression hotlines. You don't need to be experiencing a crisis to call us. Our volunteers take calls on a book you read, a movie or game you saw, or just about anything you'd like to discuss. Call 800-876-2399 to speak with a kind voice. Our volunteers aren't professional counselors. They're kind voices who are here for you. Call 800-876-2399 or visit us at akindvoice.org. When you call a kind voice, here is a montage of some of the volunteers you'll get to talk with. Hey, how you doing, Marianne? Hi, guys. Good to talk to you. A kind voice has provided space for people to talk and communicate and chat on anything from personal situations to movies, music, travel, news. So it encompasses a wide variety of topics. As we were talking about the Eagles and the and Phillies and it was so natural. It was just sort of like all of my stress went away and I got lost in the conversation about something that felt like home. Just a kind voice in that time of need. Or just to chit chat about things that, you know, you may not have in common with your mom or your dad or your sister or your sure. brother or even a best friend. You know, to be able to talk with someone that possibly you've been feeling that they don't get me. A kind voice is here. 
my voice. I feel that I've connected with so many people. We as volunteers get to know each other as kind voices as well. I just want to do something nice. It can be my fuel. And at the end of the day, if I have impacted someone's life in a positive way because of my voice, then that's great. That's what a kind voice is here for. You seem like such an inspirational woman, and I hope that we can speak again soon. I hope so, too. The Kind Voice Radio. And we welcome you back to A Kind Voice on Sports. This is your host, Demetrius Means. I am talking with former high school basketball coach and talk show host, Nikki Burns from Staten Island, New York. He is the host of Profiles, which is viewed by 8 million viewers in New York City. Nikki uh, uh, talking with many celebrities as well as so many other folks in the show business. In 1999, Nikki, you hosted and anchored and starred in numerous television programs such as Special Edition, Staten Island Live, and, uh, excuse me, for Time Warner. How much was those two shows in the beginning of your career, how different was it uh, as from what Profiles is today? Uh, that's that's a great question, uh, Demetrius, because uh, they were both, one was a news magazine, uh, which was special edition, and I really enjoyed that because it w- I was out in the field doing features on everything from hard news to sports to to, to entertainment. So so that was that was fun. I learned how to package a, a story because sometimes uh, I knew I had seven minutes or six minutes and fifteen seconds to package a story that I was covering. Uh, so you learn how, how how to do that, and and the other show, Staten Island Live, was like oh I would compare it to like Larry King Live. The difference was it was same kind of format, but you were interviewing the newsmakers in your community, such as uh, the mayor, the borough president, the police commissioner, and that was uh, I would say extraordinarily challenging because you're on live television. There's no editing. If anybody makes a mistake. Uh, it's there, and, and and you can't you can't eliminate it. So, uh, but I love the pressure of doing it live. You know that was that was exciting. So both of those shows were instrumental in I think uh, the platform uh, that was laid laid down for the success of profiles that would follow. And really, profiles what it was uh, was an offshoot of our special edition show, which was a news magazine, and one of the segments each week was. Uh, the, the little little vignettes or features on um, you know, somebody in a Broadway play, somebody coming out with, with a new album, and uh, you know we what would happen was let's say we were interviewing Spike Lee about his new movie. Uh, you would end up interviewing him for thirty minutes or twenty minutes, and only using like three minutes of it because that's what you had for special edition was like a three minute segment. And I realized I said, man, some of this stuff is awful. Uh, it's, it's strong, it's interesting, and, and it's really going to waste. I said, we should really do a long-form interview show with one guest, like you do, and and then you, you can use all the I- interview that, that you've created instead of just three minutes that we were using at the time. So, it was, so Profiles became an offshoot of the News Magazine Special Edition. Not only an offshoot, but it also was a stepping stone uh, for this show, the, your new show, Profiles, you had a chance, I mentioned earlier, you, you had a chance to interview many people like Joan Rivers, Danny Glover, Joan Collins, Larry Holmes. With all these celebrities that you interviewed, which one of them did you like the best? Well, that, you, you know that's a tough question, and, and, and I'm <laughs> going to insult, like, I think we're at 360 episodes now. We're looking forward to you know, late uh, spring for 400 so we are. That's a that's an extremely hard question. Uh, I have several several that were really uh, memorable. You know, Dr. Maya Angelou has to be at the top of the list, especially as an interviewer. You you can sympathize with me. I just wanted to be able to hold my own with Dr. Maya Angelou. Uh, so that was uh, Smokey Robinson. I uh, went into the interview uh, wondering what kind of guy he was. He's such a legend. Writ, wrote, written over 400 songs, and we ended up doing. He he didn't want to leave. We ended up doing a, like an hour interview. We made it into two episodes. Same with Tony Orlando. 
Joan Rivers I've had on the show three times. Joe Montana was personable and, and accommodating, as big as a star as he was. Last night I had LaToya Jackson on the show. We talked about uh, her life. Uh, being uh, going through domestic violence, serious domestic violence with her husband, uh, and then talking about Michael's uh, legacy um, that he left, and it was very touching. And but the list goes on and on and on. I just had Meatloaf on the show <laughs> the other day, but I must say, uh, the one thing I've prob- probably learned the most after doing 400 episodes with major celebrities is that when the interview was going on. Uh, at, at the beginning, you know, you think because I'm the host, I'm going to control this interview. And I think the key for me has been, as time has gone on, is that the key is, n- is not that. It's that I need to adjust to the guests that I have and do whatever I have to do uh, to make it an interesting interview for the, uh, for the viewer. Uh, because it's not always going to go the way you plan going in. You know, sometimes their personality is their personality, and they're going to take control of the interview. Uh, you just have to adjust to that and still still make it work. You mentioned that you have to adjust to the interview. What goals as a talk show host do you have going into the show? Yeah, that, at all? <laughs> these are great questions to me. I keep repeating that, but it's true. Uh, uh, you know, I, I go in wondering uh, what are the people who are sitting at home want to know about the guests that I have this evening, that maybe they don't know. You know, that's, that's I think, the most important thing. Uh, what's interesting about this person's life and career uh, that, that hasn't been asked a hundred times already? And to come up with something new, and most of the time the guest is very enthusiastic about that because they're not used to getting that. So I dig very deep in finding those little nuggets that have never been discussed before about their life and career. You mentioned earlier that many of your guests have said that you bring out the best in them during your interview process. Yes. What makes a good host? Well, I think the the number one thing is trust. A lot of times I I get to sit with the the guest when, when, you know, 10 minutes before the show is a lot of times the first time I meet them. Uh, So I spend time sitting with them, talking with them, and with my goal being I have 10 minutes to build up a rapport with them before we go on camera, and for them to trust me, to realize, you know, I'm really, I'm not here to hurt you. I'm here to, to make this the best interview possible. And I try to do my research prior to, to, to meeting them to know what their interests are outside of, uh, outside of their job, which is either acting or singing or professional sports. And I, and I start a rapport talking and discussing those things, whether it be family or golf, or fishing, things that would relax them and and want to talk to me uh, about their personal life. So when we sit down 10 minutes later, it's almost like they feel, oh, gee, I know this guy. You know, it's not like we're strangers or seeing each other for the first time. And this this, this approach has helped me a great deal. Uh, so what is I'm, – I'm sorry. Did you want no, to it's that? just helped me a great deal in in having them relaxed and open by the time they sit down and the cameras go on. As you know, there are many different uh, talk show hosts. Uh, of course, you remember Larry King. You, there's Oprah Winfrey. Uh, is there any talk show host that you may have modeled yourself after, or is there one that you like more than the other? Yeah, well, uh, you know, I, I, I think the most important thing about being a talk show host is uniqueness. You know, so I, I've never uh, tailored my, my approach or my style after another talk show host. I've always tried to be original, and I think that's important. I think a lot of people get into the business and, and, and they, try, they, tr- they try to be like Jay Leno. You know, they try to be uh, like, like Larry King, and, 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 and it doesn't work. We already have one of those. You know, so I always wanted to approach it like, well, there's only one Mickey Burns. You know, there isn't another, and, and I want to be unique and, and be myself and be different. Uh, you do mention Larry King. I, I always felt that he was... He was one of my favorites, and I thought he always got the most out of his guests, uh, and he did it in a very simple way, which I thought was almost genius. And I think he was very underrated in what he did because he would ask very simple, direct questions, but he always always got tremendous feedback from those questions. 
Uh, not many people would be able to get away with that today. You mentioned earlier about every talk show host has their own style, and you should try to be yourself and not anyone else. What makes Mickey Burns different from other hosts? Um, that's, <laughs> I'm not even sure, except that uh, I think a lot, a lot of my presentation is, is, is my natural personality. Uh, when I sit down in front of, in front of my guests, uh, I, I don't try to be a talk show host, as I said. I try to make them as relaxed as possible. I want to look as relaxed as possible. One of my mentors, Bill McCreary, whom you know, uh, who was, a ho- was an anchor at, Ch- at Fox in New York for like 25 years. And uh, he, when he was mentoring me years ago, he said, number one, never let them see you sweat. <laughs> and, and, I, and I said, that, that's a great, great lesson. And my father... Uh, uh, taught me a great lesson many, many years ago. And uh, it, I, when I was playing baseball, uh, because I, I, I've used this approach with interviewing, if, if, a, if one of my questions ruffles the feathers of the person I'm interviewing and I could see they're getting upset or they say, I don't want to talk about this, I find myself, I, I relax, I smile, and I go to the next question. When I was playing baseball in the Little League, my father told me, you see that kid, he struck out, he threw the bat. He, he, he was uh, making a big fuss that he struck out. Everybody here knows that he struck out. He said, but if you put the bat down quietly and you run to the dugout and sit down, two minutes later everyone will forget <clears throat> excuse me, that you struck out. And it's the same way as an interviewer. You know, if you know how to escape an awkward situation, uh, then two minutes later people are going to forget that you were even in that awkward situation. So I think that's another angle of that, that I've taken. And I've had many awkward situations, but I know how to escape them and move on in the, within the interview. I was going to ask you about that, but you, you got ahead of me. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, no, that's fine. <clears throat> Can you recall a situation where uh, a guest, it was hard to get that guest to open up, and how did you go about handling that? Well, I'll, I'll give you an example. I mean, Meatloaf. Meatloaf has a, has a history uh, and, a, and a reputation of not liking journalists and interviewers. You know, so, so I knew going in that this is what to expect. I said, yeah, this is going to be tough. You know, and remind me to ask uh, remind me to ask ask me later about Christopher Plummer. That's another good example. Uh, but Meatloaf, um, as soon as he sat down, I said, "Oh, welcome to to Profiles." You know, f- uh, forty eight years in the business. He stops me right there. No, it's only been forty four years. <laughs> you see, so right away he's giving me a hard time, and then he says, "Let me think." Oh no, you're right. It is it is forty forty eight years. And then some. I said, "You've been in sixty movies." He said, "No, I've only been in fifty eight. And then he thought, oh, well, but I was going to be, you know, so he was being very difficult, you know. So what I did is I turned it around and said, you know, please excuse me, but I have difficulty with numbers. Yeah, and he laughed, you know, because I kind of put the attention on my lack of, of being able to, to count as opposed to uh, pressure him on his constant contradicting of what my questions were. And after he, we got through this, then we had a great interview from that point forth. Um, the other thing was with Christopher Plummer. And, and of course, I want to share this with you, but you're in, you're in radio, I'm in television. The week before he was to appear on my show, he had just won the Oscar for uh, Supporting Actor, and he, and, and he just put out his, his, his autobiography. And... I was listening, doing my research to a, a past radio interview about a week earlier. And after two questions from the radio host, Christopher Plummer stopped him and said, excuse me, but did you read my book? And, and, and the host said, uh, 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 I, I, I really didn't get to it, you know, but I'm going to read it. And with that, Christopher Plummer hung up the phone, and that was the end of that interview after about three minutes. Okay. I said, oh, my goodness, I better, I better read Christopher's book or the same thing's going to happen to me. So when our interview came, I started off my Profiles episode with him saying, Mr. Plummer, may I read a quote from your book? Which I did. And he said, oh, man. This, he said, you, you must have read the book. 
I said, yeah, but it wasn't easy. I mean, the thing was huge, you know, but I, I enjoyed reading it. And later on, I want to ask you some more questions, uh, you know, some more quotes from the book. And from that point on, he gave me whatever I wanted because he realized I had enough respect for him to do my due diligence and, and read that book. You're listening to A Kind Voice on Sports with your host, Demetrius Means. I am talking with Mickey Burns, former high school basketball coach and talk show host. And with any talk show host, research needs to be done. But we're going to take a break. When we come back, I will ask Mickey, what drives him to be a good talk show host and what drives him to be a better interviewer? We'll have that and more after we take this break. We'll be right back with more of A Kind Voice on Sports right after these words. From our sponsors. Hi, this is Bruce Grammel. I wrote my song, The Alchemy of Kindness, after I became familiar with the organization called A Kind Voice. A Kind Voice is a community of volunteers that provide the opportunity for conversation on a variety of topics. The title is one of their slogans, and the phrase really hits home with me. I hope that you'll enjoy my song, and whether you may be a caller or a future volunteer, I hope you'll take the time to find out more about the wonderful folks at A Kind Voice. The alchemy of kindness is one that we believe. When we reach out to each other, you know we both receive. We're always here for you, we're right beside the phone. When kind voices come together, it seems we're never alone. So if you're reaching out, you know we're reaching too. Pick up the phone, that's all you have to do. Call us now if you need a kind voice. Back to a kind voice on sports. This is your host Demetrius Means. I am talking with former high school basketball coach and talk show host Mickey Burns. He is the host of Profiles, a show in New York City that is viewed by more than 800 million viewers. Coach Mickey Burns, what drives you to be a good talk show host? You have done over 300 shows. How do you get? The, what keeps the drive going for you? Uh, that's a, that's a good one too. Um, I think there's a lot of things, but I think number one, right off the bat, is that what I do and what I have been doing 
uh, it takes a lot of people. It takes a team, and and I've had a team together now since Profile started 12 years ago. We have the same people. So what drives me is is really to, to, one thing is to not let them down because they've worked so darn hard. They bought into this 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 show, this philosophy, this product, and it would break my heart if I didn't give. Uh, everything that I had to make it the best show it could be because I don't want to let them down. Uh, the second thing is, I'm, as you know, as, <laughs> as you know, I'm a type A personality, <laughs> and, and and I don't really know any other way. Uh, just like with the coaching, right? If I if I can't go all in, then I don't want to be in, you know. And that's the way I was with. I think I, I have the same ethic. Work ethic as as I have uh, in, as I had in coaching basketball as I have as a, as a talk show host. It's a team effort, and and uh, we're 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 out there to win and to be the best we can be. But I will say this, you know, and I also believe very very deeply, uh, you know, that when once you have the attitude that that you feel that you've accomplished something, or, or that you've made it to the mountain top, and and you're there, uh, you're done. You're done. I think you need to. Learn every day, be better every day, and strive to be better every day. And I think that's just the way my personality is. That's the way my team is. That's the way your team was when you played basketball for me. And that's the way I live my life. And it's obvious that your work ethic has paid off. In 2008, you were honored with an outstanding alumni award from Missouri Valley, from your alma mater, Missouri Valley College in uh Marshall, Missouri. What did that mean to you? I, I can't tell you what a thrill what a thrill that was. Especially somebody like myself. I was the first person in my family to attend college. That was such a thrill just to go to college, let alone graduate from college, and then to go back and, and receive the outstanding alumni award. And I must say, I was their commencement speaker in 2012, and they bestowed an honorary doctorate uh, to me. Uh, and so now, I mean, I have people calling me Dr. Burns, but mostly it's in restaurants just to get a better table. You know, you talk about that. That was, that was a joke. <laughs> well, well, I know. I know. But, but being that you mentioned that, you know, one of the things that comes with the role as a talk show host is that you become a celebrity, not only in Staten Island, but throughout New York City. How do you keep yourself humble when you're in that type of a position? Yeah, well, that's even a, that's even a better question. Um, I, I, because I, I mean, when I first started Profiles, I could pretty much go anywhere in New York City. Nobody would bother me. Uh, now I go on the subway. I saw your show with Latoya Jackson last night. It was fabulous. Um, but what I what I've learned is anybody. I don't care where they are or where I'm going. I always take the time out to make that person feel like I appreciate the fact that they recognized me and they ask me questions about the show. I've never given anybody the bum rush. If they want to take a picture or they want to ask me a question about it, I always give them the time and try to ask them a couple of questions about themselves, what do they do. And and, and I think that's, uh, that's because I really have a problem with celebrities when they get to a certain level and, and they kind of have that I'm, I'm better than everybody else attitude. Uh, so I, I try to compensate and do just the opposite. And uh, I, I don't consider myself a celebrity, but when people recognize me for the show, it's flattering and I, I certainly return the attention. And as people recognize you for the show and you receive these awards and the accolades and you see how the show has gone from uh, 250 episodes now to 300 and more. Can your show get better? Uh, yeah, that's a good. Yeah, I think so. I think so because I mean, you know, the uh, it's only going to get better with, uh, uh, with with coming up with better interviews for our guests. Uh, the set is as you know, we love the set. We we love the everything is in HD now, and we've kind of. Uh, learned how to how to deal with HD. Not all the guests love the HD because, especially the women, you can see all you know the makeup has got to be just perfect, or you see every flaw in a person with with HD, which you didn't see uh, before with just digital. So so we've graduated to now the HD world, but the show can. can we're always trying to find uh, ways to uh, make the show uh, better, and and that's got to that's on my shoulders to make the interviews uh, better. 
And it's as simple as that. If the if my interviews aren't getting better, uh, you know, then there's something wrong. And we and we discuss it all the time. Should, you know, should I ask this question, that question? Uh, did I spend too much time asking him about his career? Maybe I should have talked more about his family. So you're always uh, analyzing what you've done in the past and then coming up with a strategy uh, to improve it in, in the future. And as you see yourself uh, getting better, where do you see yourself five or ten years from now? You know, that's another good question because, um, uh, you know, when uh, recently uh, there was some, some rhetoric about uh, possibly – being considered for, uh, you know, the CNN just let go of uh, Piers Morgan, and there was some, some talk that uh, I was being considered for that for that spot, uh, you know, and, and to me that would be, uh, you know, the ultimate uh, job in, in, in broadcasting, S- something like that. Um, I don't visualize myself sitting in that seat because I love – doing what I'm doing. It's not a national audience, but it's the number one market in the United States. So I, I and, and 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 I was talking with people in, in on my team the other day and at this point for me to move to the to the next level, which would be a national level, um I I would do it, but I would do it only if I could take care of the team that's been loyal to me for twelve years with profiles. If I could bring them along uh, then, then, you know, moving to a national uh, venue would be possible, but I wouldn't do it by myself. What's the thing that you enjoy most about hosting your show? Uh, I, it's the challenge of of, uh, of of making celebrities give me the best that they can give and giving, I mean, I just had Petula Clark on the show. You know, she's a legendary singer from England, their top star for like 30 years, uh, female. And she, for years and years, in doing the research, uh, some years ago she met John Lennon and Yoko Ono at their bed-in in Montreal. And every piece of research I, that, I, that I found said, oh, uh, John Lennon gives Petula Clark some advice, but till this day she never disclosed what that advice was. And in the interview I had with her a couple of weeks ago, she disclosed it to me for the first time. So what? Why did she do that? You know, and I think the reason was, you know, I built the trust, uh, I built the confidence, I gave her confidence. Uh, she was thrilled with the interview up to that point, and she, she wanted to give me a little bit extra. So after holding this secret in for forty years, uh, she she talked about it on my show. And uh, what could be more thrilling than that? As a former player, and also as a a former coach, do you get a sense when you know that you're in a rhythm as a talk show host? Absolutely, absolutely, and and uh, and and you know it as a player. When you were player, you were a great player. I don't know if your viewers know that, but I mean, you were an outstanding high school basketball player on a top, one of the top teams in the in the country. And I always say this, you know, you know when you're in that rhythm. As a talk show host, you know it. When you, as a player. You know it. But I said the key <laughs> to be successful is, yeah, it's good to be in that rhythm. But what happens when you're no longer in that rhythm? How do you adjust and get back and get it back? And how do you still win when you lose the rhythm, when things aren't going your way? But you some, somehow find a way to still make it a great interview and to somehow somehow win that game. That's, that's the real trick. Because, you know, obviously when you're in the rhythm, everything is going your way. But I don't think that's the true sign of a winner. It's how to overcome those uh, those bumps in the road and those mountains that you know you're going to face, either it's in a game or in an interview. That's the key to being, to being I think, top, like your team was. And your team overcame a lot of obstacles. You're listening to A Kind Voice on Sports with your host, Demetrius Means. I am talking with former high school basketball coach, Mickey Burns, and talk show host. We talked about finding the rhythm. How much does instincts come into play as a talk show host? Yeah, I think instincts are a a big part of it, you know. And uh, I I remember one time uh, Eric Roberts, Julia Roberts' brother, also a fine actor in his own right, 
And he was, the te- I wasn't comfortable. I was in my rhythm, but he was slowing me down with his rhythm. And I became very uncomfortable with it, and I was trying to speed him up. And I said, wait a minute. I, I know what he's trying to he He's trying to be sincere, and he's trying to be heartfelt, and he's trying to be sensitive. And I'm not letting him. I'm trying to get him into my rhythm. But what he's trying to tell me takes thought and, 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 with, and a slower tempo. And I realized that I backed off, and I kind of adopted his rhythm. And what a show it was. It was fantastic. It was he talked about his drug use and his <clears throat> his years of being blackballed in Hollywood because of it, his sister not talking to him for ten years, but he wanted to talk about that softly, sensitively, and I wasn't allowing him to once i I backed off uh, it was one of the best shows we've ever had, so rhythm Obviously. is important the rhythm is important, but it's not always going to be your rhythm. <laughs> but, you know, it might be their rhythm. Just so, you have to identify it, you know. So, what things are are the most difficult things for you as a talk show host, if the, anything? Ah, that's I I I think the most the most difficult is when you enter an interview, and the person that you're interviewing either doesn't that talks too much, or doesn't talk enough. Gives you one word answers. You know, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. Had Ben Vereen on the show. Uh, ben Vereen, very major, big star on Broadway with Pippin and so on. Really talented. But for some reason, I asked him a question, and he went off for like 20 minutes. And he would, every time I tried to interrupt him, or at least to intercede to ask him another question, he would say, uh, let me just finish my thoughts. Let me just finish my thoughts. Well, 20 minutes later... He finished that thought, and I said, geez, I have like, you know, ten pages of questions in my head that I want to ask you, and uh, we've only got five minutes left. So I said, you know, you know, I'm saying to myself, I don't know what to do. So I basically had to interview him for like 45 minutes to get a, a 25-minute interview. Uh, but that, that, that's the worst that's the worst case scenario. It's happened two or three times, you know, because – a good interview is give and take, right? Like what we're you ask me a question, I answer it. You give me another question, and it's 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 like, you know, it's like tennis. You know, you're in a groove back and forth. An interview is the same way, uh, but if the uh, person you're interviewing goes on for 20 minutes, it's not much of an interview. So is it rude to cut the person off? N- n- well, in, in some cases, it it, it, it is. But you still have to, your job is to come up with an episode that is compelling and interesting. And it's not interesting, so you might have to jump in somehow, some way, if, you, if, if they'll allow you to, uh, you know, to get to other questions. And the other problem is, you know, <laughs> I've had some guests where, you know, you have, uh, you know, I have a, like a, uh, a timer in my head, so I know where I'm at in the interview, and I have... X amount of questions that I'm kind of prepared to go in with. And if they come up with one-word answers, if it's a half-hour show, sometimes you'll find out, you know, in in the 16-minute mark, you're out of questions. That's what's called real panic, especially on live television. (laughs) You know, and that's when they might see you sweat. So, you know, the, the idea is to always, always have more questions than you're going to need. So you don't get caught into that, that scenario. When your show has become popular as it is now, and you are a person who is very visible, do you consider yourself a role model? Uh, you know, that's I, 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 you know, I, I don't, I, I don't think of myself as one. I really don't, uh, but I do try to do the best I can. Uh, you know, I've never, I mean, in all the years I've been doing this, I've never really, and I'm sure they say this behind my back. But I've never come across anyone in public who say, man, I saw your show the other night and you were terrible. You know, I've, I've never had that experience. Uh, so, I, I mean, the, the question, repeat that question one more time, Dave. Do you consider yourself a yeah, role model? Yeah, as a role model. model because, uh, no, I, I just try to do the best I can because I have a responsibility to my team, to the network, and to the viewers. And, and, and that's that's all I want to do is the best I can. If I become a role model for someone who says, wow, I really like what he does, and I want to become a broadcaster when I grow up, 
or, or somebody wants to change careers and, and says, oh, I want to do that. But the one thing I've learned about talk show hosts, and maybe you can attest to this, uh, sometimes we make it a lot, look a lot easier than it is. I don't know that's, if you would agree with that. But oh, a lot that's of times correct. You, pe- people see you on TV and say, oh, man, he may- he's, looks like he's talking in his living room. They don't know that you've done 10 hours of research, read the person's book that you're interviewing, you know, and ha- you're already 12, 12 hours into preparation for this, and then you make it look like uh, uh, it's a walk in the park. That, it's not as easy as sometimes interviewers make it look. It's, it's much more difficult and, and work intensive than that. Would you agree with that thing? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Right. So that that's it. But if you, if I become a role model, that's that would be that's great. But I, I'm not out there trying to be one. I'm just trying to do the best I can. You're listening to a kind voice on sports with your host Demetrius Means. I am talking with Mickey Burns, former high school basketball coach turned talk show host. Is there anyone that you would like to interview that you have not? Well, there's a couple. You know, there's a few. I, I, most of the people that I've always wanted to interview, I have. I've interviewed the biggest sports, you know, George, like you said, George Foreman, Earl of Pearl Monroe in sports, Joe Montana, and some of the, you know, many, many Rock and Roll Hall of Famers. So, but, the, yeah, there is one person, as you know, at one per, you didn't even mention this, Dave, but at one point I was a singer as well. That's right. You didn't mention that, but. Well, that was coming. <laughs> yeah, well, that, I'm afraid I was. I'm afraid I was afraid of that. But uh, you know, the, the one the one person who I always admired as as a singer was Tom Jones, as you know, and and uh, I've always wanted him on the show, and uh, it, it will happen. We've reached out a couple of times. We almost had him a couple of times. And the other one is Engelbert Humperdinck. I I, I kind of loved him too. Because every time I go into the supermarket, uh, they play his his best, uh, greatest hits album, you know, and uh, it's all great stuff. So uh, I have a chance of uh, we'll, we'll know later this week uh, scheduling him for April fourth. So yeah, we put people on our hit list, and sometimes we get them. Most of the time we get them, and uh, but sometimes you don't. Not only have you tried your hand in, in singing, and it was very successful in that. But trying and singing, as well as uh, coaching, and now a talk show host. For you, those three things. What do they all have in common that has helped you become successful? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I once again, I, I think um, I, I never, never considered myself a, a good singer. Not even a. Uh, I, I was, I was an okay singer. I just loved music. And love being involved, and once again in the team, you know, a band putting together a band and 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 doing performances is all about a team effort. You know, you're rehearsing two or three days a week, and there's no greater reward uh, than when the performances uh, come off great and you feel so good about yourself. And it, it, there's nothing like uh, performing in front of a live audience that appreciates your efforts. So I think that's it's the same with being an athlete. And uh, being a uh, a talk show host, I, I'm, I'm wondering why I didn't do something uh, that was uh, maybe seeking a little less attention along the way. Is there anything that you would do different uh, uh, if you were starting uh, over? Uh, well, as I said at the top, if uh, I don't think it was a matter of uh, doing anything differently, I think it, a lot of times I've all, I've always say this, you know, sometimes better lucky than good. That that's important. Being in the right place at the right time, and in, in my case, uh, when I was going to college, broadcasting was 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 a difficult uh, arena to enter. Uh, as if I was in college today, I I would be all in 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 the broadcasting industry from day one. So it was a matter of timing. But had I done that, I would have never had the experience. Of coaching high school basketball for, for, for several years and meeting uh, coaching teams like the one you played on, so uh, I would have been a much lesser person had I not had that experience. As a talk show host, you being in your mid sixties, are you afraid of getting old in this business? Uh, I, I, you know, I'm I'm not sure, Dave. That that's a good that's a good question. Um, I, I'm, my health is great. Uh, I'm still in good shape. Um, uh, the average age of the New York City television viewer is uh, 52 years old. 
part of the part of our success is that uh, a great deal of our success is that we're bringing uh, our viewers uh, guests that they may not see on, on the Tonight Show or the Letterman Show, uh, but they're icons and they grew, grew up watching these people on television or watching them play ball, uh, the professional sports people, and you know then they don't have an opportunity to see these these people anymore in an in-depth interview, so. The, the age thing and the getting older thing uh, is, I think, part of our success because we, you know, we're reaching who we're serving. Who's watching television? Kids today are not watching television. You know, they're on iPads and computers. I mean, we're in that arena too. You know, we're on YouTube and we're on Amazon. We're in all of that. Uh, but but on television, the kids are not watching it anymore. The baby boomers are watching it. Uh, people who are from 40 to 70. And the guests that we bring on the show are the people that they grew up as fans or watching them on television. So that, that's a great deal uh, has led to our success is that uh, we, we, we fell upon something, uh, our niche, so to speak, uh, that very few people are doing. For many who are, who are listening today and they've seen where you have come from as a basketball coach, uh, well, a singer, a basketball coach, a talk show host, for those who would like to see some of your shows and to see what you're all about, is there a website where people can uh, go on to it and see your information? Yeah, yeah, there's several. There's several. I mean, uh, first of all, uh, let me give the information on the on the website itself. You can always go to Profiles with an S, right? Profiles TV Show dot net, and that's that's tells you who's going to be on that week uh, in the New York area. But there's a drop down where it says Watch Now, and uh, the NYC Media Network. Uh, they have they post our shows on their video on demand within their website, and there must be fifty of our shows that are posted there. Uh, we're also uh, we've also uh, partnered with uh, the Reserve Channel, which is part of YouTube, and you can just go to Reserve Channel uh, uh, profiles, and each Tuesday they put a new show up there in its entirety. That's the Reserve Channel uh, profiles. Um, so th- those two areas, uh, and, and on Amazon, if anyone is interested in, uh, let's say, buying one of our tapes uh, for a relative or somebody who's a big fan of, let's say, Smokey Robinson or uh, Earl of Pearl Monroe, all of those episodes are available on Amazon. All they have to do is go to Amazon and put in uh, you know, tapes and DVDs and look for uh, uh, profiles featuring, and then the, the whole list will come down to all the, all the people we've had as guests. And they make great gifts for fans and uh, sons and daughters of, of fans and so forth. And if somebody wants to contact you? Uh, I, I mean, the, the, best, the best way to do it is, is, is to go to our website, which is, uh, you know, questmedia.net, uh, and, and you, can, you can do a contact there. Uh, and also go to profilestvshow.net, dot net, and you, and you can do it there. And and they can search Quest Media Entertainment Inc. on on the web, and and the phone number and the address to contact uh, the office is everything is there. Okay, Mickey, I got about sixty seconds left. It's time. Uh, this is the time of the show where I do something called rapid fire. I'll ask you ten questions. You give me the first thought that comes to mind. You ready? Yep. All right, coaching. Uh. Big part, well, big part of my life. Talk show host. Um, very rewarding. Passion. Uh, talk show. Education. Uh, key to success. Politics. Wish I was uh, more a part of it. Quest Media Entertainment. The mouse that roared. Favorite book. Uh, I think that my favorite book would have to be uh, uh, Ernest Borgnine's biography. Favorite movie? Casablanca. If you could be someone other than Mickey Burns, who would it be? Just for a day or for the rest of my life? For the day. Tom Jones. And who was your role model? Uh, my high school football coach, Sal Soma. <laughs> it has been a pleasure for the hour to have you on a kind voice on sports. I appreciate you taking time out for us and wish you much success uh, in the coming year. 
Demetrius, let me tell you, you do a, a, a tremendous job uh, with your show, and it was an honor being on it. Uh, continued success uh, uh, down the road uh, with it. It's uh, much success. Appreciate having you on, and thanks again for being part of the show, Mickey. It was wonderful talking with you. Okay, God bless. God bless you. All right, you've been listening to A Kind Voice on Sports with your host, Demetrius Means. I want to thank my guest, Mickey Burns, and I want to thank the second partner of our broadcast team, Dave Levins, our engineer producer on the night. Until next time, you can be part of A Kind Voice on Sports. All you have to do is tune in at 7 p.m. Eastern Time every Thursday night. And as I said, until next time, take care of yourself, because I'd rather be talking to you than about you. You have been listening to A Kind Voice on Sports. Choice to be a kind.